You are listening to Claret and Blue, an Aston Villa podcast brought to you by Birmingham Live. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Claret and Blue podcast. It's two in two days. James, we're back again to talk about Aston Villa. We're here to talk about Ollie Watkins again, but today he's officially signed and we've got some breaking news at last. Yeah, you, you can't get rid of us, can you? Like, <laughs> Villa are closing madness at the moment. Um, <laughs> yesterday was a bad, mad day for transfer rumours. The second we got off, it was just like, bang, bang, this, that, everything. Yeah. Gil Bear comes down, on yeah. Instagram, isn't it? Yeah. Us in. I felt subtweeted. I know, he, what, I, don't, I know he don't even know who we are, but like, <laughs> the fact we said the homesick thing, and he comes out with it, it just makes you feel sad, man. Like, bet, absolutely bet, in the mud. Uh, but no, it was brilliant, man. Like, today is as far, the news today. Is that what we were all been waiting for, really, yeah. anytime. This is the one we've all been waiting for, which is what Villa tweeted in their announcement. Um, similar to what we did with the Matty Cash episode when we got a, a colleague from the Nottingham Post on uh, to talk about Matty, we've got uh, Billy the B from the Besotted podcast. Billy, welcome to the show in your snazzy shirt. I love that, by the way. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me, guys. And like I said to you, I, I was hoping this would be our promotion shirt last season, but it didn't quite work out that way. Yeah, we, we won't we won't talk about that too much. I'm also wearing a shirt when I thought Villa were going to get promoted and that didn't turn out either, but we are where we are now. Um, first of all, Billy, your initial reaction to, to Watkins going, is it is it sadness or are you kind of happy with the, the big book coming your way? I mean, there's two sides to it. I mean, you know, first of all, Ollie Watkins, he's a, a lovely bloke. He's a brilliant player. And to be honest with you, as a Brentford fan, you know, we are we're a small club. And as you know, when I mean, you've bought a few players of us, Scott Hogan, you've got the Erzy Konza, you know that we are, a, as they call it, a selling club. We don't sell all the time, but you know, but we, we sell if the price is right. And we actually thought that Ollie Watkins was going to go last summer. You know, we had him for a couple of seasons. He was hot property. People knew that he was hot property. We knew he was hot property. But for fair play to Brentford and the directors of football, they turned around to Ollie and said, listen, we're going to go for it this season, Ollie. You know, we're going to go for a big push. We're going to go for promotion. And we want you to be part of it because you're, you're a key player. And fair play to Ollie Watkins, side Ben Rama, you know, the, you know, our clear players last season, they said, we'll stay with you. And they stay with us last season. So we didn't actually lose that many players last season. So it's a bit of a weird one for Bees because when we first came in the championship, we were so, you know, Andre Gray, we signed him. Great, we signed him for £500,000. In one season, he scored 18 goals. You know, everyone's after him, 8 million, 9 million. Brentford fans are getting really angry, as you, you could probably have seen, you know, when people come and sort of scouting our players. But we weren't really used to this idea of people wanting our players. We're Brentford, you know. But, um, you know, when Andre Gray went, you know, we got a little bit nervous, but Brentford kept saying, don't worry, we replaced him. And we're like, how are you going to do that? And then they replaced him. And then Scott Hogan came. And then, you know, we got angry again. But then we replaced him. They keep on doing it. And after sort of six years down the line, or whatever it is, we're a little bit more relaxed and we actually trust the directors of football and the process, as they call it, that they will replace them. And, that, you know, as we have did, we already bought Ivan Tony. So we bought yeah. Ivan Tony from Peterborough, highly regarded, Division One player of the year, scores goals, find, you know, finds spaces in the middle of nowhere. And, and he's going to be very, very good his all round grain. But we still got to develop him, sign him for six million. And at that stage, we knew Ollie Watkins was going to go. He was going to leave Brentford. So we've already braced ourselves for him leaving. And he leaves with our blessing. I don't know any Brentford fan who's wishing him bad. We want him good luck. He's a lovely bloke. He's a great player. He's a great professional. Brentford, as you know, they don't... Um, um, Thomas Frank has got a phrase and he said it. You know, when Brentford pick up players, we, we've evolved in the type of players we bet. And he says that we don't buy any... Um, dickheads as it is and it was a phrase <laughs> that he used this we don't you know so they they only buy players who are kind of like you know right behind the scenes as well as well as on the pitch and he fits both sides and ollie watkins you know i say somebody quite senior in the club they said to me that they believe that he's going to go all the way and play for england next year in the european wow. championship and that's a big big shout and i i go go with that 100 he's the type of player that can do that so my, my first question was going to be, were you always kind of resigned to, to losing them when you when you obviously didn't get promoted in the playoffs? Did you just think, oh, well, it's inevitable that, that we'll lose him now? And the same with Ben Rama as well. Obviously, uh, Villa have been linked with us. You know, everyone sort of looked at those two and thought, oh, yeah, they'll, they'll definitely leave now. But it's taken until the 9th of September for one of them to go. And you've still got Ben Rama. Is, is it always just felt like a case that, yeah, they'll go, but we're Brentford, we'll replace them anyway and we'll probably be OK? Uh, no, 100%. We knew that we are going to go. You know, they'd spent an extra season at Brentford. Normally, there's a two-year turnaround with players. We get the players in. We develop them up. They're rough diamonds, as we call them. You know, we find them, you know, using our statistical methods, our scouting methods. We find players that, you know, maybe other teams are not willing to take a risk on. 
you know. And then, you know, like Ollie Watkins, when he came to Brentford, you know, he wasn't the full, you know, he wasn't the full ticket. You know, we had to develop him up. It's taken him three years to get to this stage. So, you know, it's the same thing. So, but normally after two years, people say, oh, that's quite a good player. And then they come in by us. So, you know, after the second year, like I said to you, you know, we expected them to go um, and they didn't go. Um, but when we didn't go up this season, everyone just knew it. They just knew that Ollie Watkins and Ben Rama were going to go. I know there's a few other players that have been touted. You know, we've got Rico Henry. You know, Arsenal come in and they bid sort of 10 million for, for Raya, which is our goalkeeper, which we've rejected that as well. Because Brentford, you know, we're in the situation now. We're not saying that we are we're being arrogant, you know, but you've also got to have a plan. And the good thing about the Bees, and we've learned this again as fans over time, they've got a plan. And their plan is that, listen, you know, we've got, we haven't gone up this season. These players have got high value now. We'd have to move them on and do the same thing and develop new players up with the, you know, 20, 45, 50 million that we're going to get for these two players. We we'll probably won't have a 10. Now we'd be able to buy quite a few other players and bring them in and develop them up, but also do it in a way that you're not actually bankrupting yourself. You know, we're in COVID times now as well. A lot of clubs are going to be in a lot of problems as well. So we need to make sure that we kind of balance ourselves up and make sure that we don't get ourselves into a pickle. So Brentford fans were really, you know, we were resigned to the fact that, you know, Oli was going to go and we already got our heads around it. Doesn't mean that we're not sad. I mean, I'm really sad to see him go. He's a great player. And the fact is, I know that if we stayed up 100%, he would have stayed with Brentford. Because, you know, it's a case of, you know, where do you move to now? Premier League, Brentford or Premier League, you know? And this is no disrespect to Villa. Because, listen, Villa, big side, Paul side. I was there, you know, last year, semi-finals um, last season, the finals at Villa Park. I was right there in the middle. Listen, I've got knocking your club at all. You know, wicked club. But if you're both in the Premier League at that stage, Wally Watkins might say, tell you something, I might stay at Brentford for another season or two. Then maybe I might go for a move to Leicester or Arsenal or wherever else it may be. But it didn't happen. And listen, that's just the way it goes. We've got to move on. And I know I sound like a real, really resigned fan. And I'm not, doesn't mean I'm not saying. I'm just, we, we, we've, got, we've got used to it. That's what it is. Right then, I think uh, to be, I was going to put you on the spot, mate. And I was going to say, what do you think about Villa always being linked um, to Brentford's players? It's always going to be a natural thing, right? But Billy, what is the best thing about Ollie Watkins in your mind? Um, I, I can't name them all. His attitude is the first thing as well. I, I'm going to give you an that. example, okay? Ollie Watkins came to us and, you know, we, we were like, is he, a, is he a striker? Is he a winger? He, he, he ended up sort of going out onto the wing. He could play up front, but apparently he, he preferred to play out on the wing because that means that the, the position that he could play, he can go out and get the ball, you know, he can come a little bit deeper and, you know, that's the way that he wanted to play. So he played that position for two seasons. Last season, at the beginning of the season, we were in for this... Uh, this uh, striker called Godosh, who, uh, who was a Swedish striker, Iranian Swedish striker, and it all went a bit horribly wrong. His agents sort of stepped in, um, <laughs> quite a lot of them. And uh, <laughs> let's just say that the deal didn't go particularly well. So uh, Brentford pulled out at the very last minute on the final day of, uh, of, of, of the transfer deadline day. We tried to go in for uh, Carl T um, Lyle Taylor from Charlton as well, but it's very, very late. I think we bid, you know, pretty much up to the limit that we wanted to, about four million. Um, they weren't accepted if Charlton wanted more. And we were like, well, that's it. So we pulled out. So we ended up not having a, a striker after selling Neil Malpe, who obviously was very, very good for us that season. Now, that kind of put us in a bit of a pickle. We thought, where are we going to go? We went up to Ollie, sort of tapped him on the shoulder, said, right, Ollie, right, well, we haven't got a striker in now. So you are going to have to learn how to play striker. And he, he kind of went, all right, then. And he went in front of the fans and he said to me, listen, <laughs> I've got this new job as a striker. I've never really done it before. So just stay with me. Just bear with me, can you? Because it's going to, you know, I'm still learning. So he almost like sort of didn't beg the fans, but he went to the fans, look, you know, this isn't my job. So just just don't give me any grief if I sort of miss a goal from three yards. Just bear with me. So he sat down, he knuckled down, and he ended up doing obviously a brilliant job. It's been the best move that he could ever done. And that is so typical Ollie Watkins. He He's great in the air, scored headed goals, but also what's as good is his, his link play is good. He's good at putting players into play, but also he's great defensively as well. So he comes back, he tracks back and he helps you out. He works so, so hard. And if you see some of the games, even some of the games that we played in the playoffs, you know, there were some um, games that he didn't really have the opportunities that he could have got. So some little people say, oh, Ollie Watkins, he's not really in this game because, you know, he, he might have only got one or two chances to put the ball in the back of the net, whereas normally we create more chances. But if you look at what he was doing and where he was all over the pitch, you know, trying to ensure that, you know, the game is kept tight and he's trying to close down players. For me, that's a really, really good side of Ollie Watkins. And that's why, you know, and, you know, I know for a fact, like I said, the England staff out there will be watching him 
Um, I know they're watching him because uh, I've been told they're watching him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because he's a great player and he's a really, really good bloke. Well, there's a lot of people talking about the transfer fee, isn't there? That you know, 28 million rising to 33. I assume those 33 would, uh, you know, that 33 million would be uh, dependent on international appearances. The transfer fee is kind of irrelevant to me as a, as a fan. I don't really care. It, fortunately, it doesn't come out of my bank account. If if he's a good signing and it works out, that money will become cheap, won't it? And if he if he gets an international cap in the next couple of years, it's because he's been a successful player for Aston Villa. So the transfer fee doesn't doesn't really uh, bother me. Just interestingly, I've been looking on his Wikipedia page because that's the, you know, the height of football re- research, of course. And there's a little segment about style of play. And he says, Watkins describes himself as a number 10. So I don't know when this interview was. And named Thierry Henry as his sporting idol, stating that I'll try to base my game on his by driving at defenders and looking to make something happen when I get the ball. Um, but yeah, I don't know when that interview came about, but he scores goals, doesn't he? 26 goals yeah. in the championship. Do you think he'll be able to make the step up and score goals in the Premier League as well? Though? That's the, the thing for Villa fans now. 100%. I mean, you know, like, like I said to you, if he was with us, you know, he would have stayed with Brentford and we would have been delighted to have him because he, you know, he's he's learning. He was still learning. Look, he learned how to be a striker in a year, you know, and the fact is that the way that he applies himself, he's a really clever and he's a really tricky player. And uh, it's interesting as well because when you're, you, you, you know, you, you, you guys must know this, you know, you're in the championship. And when you're in the championship, you know everything about the championship. You know about all the teams and the strikers and the players and who's hot and who's not. But it's quite funny because, you know, when players sort of step up to the Premier League, you know, there's so many people that I know who are Premier League fans who had no idea. You sort of think, I'm not being funny. If you need to know anything about the championship, there's probably five players that you need to know about. And Ollie Watkins is one of them. And of course, the only time they actually kind of got to see him and hear about him was the playoffs because there was no other football at the time, so they start to watch it. So there I was on, on on Ollie Watkins at the time. So that to me is when I realised that even though I've got the knowledge and all the Championship people have got the knowledge about Ollie Watkins, there's so many people in Premier League and probably in management and probably in scouting land that just don't have the knowledge about Ollie Watkins to think how good he went. And you know, I can't remember somebody from my team just said, "Do you think he'll do a job for us? Do you think he's going to be okay?" And I was just thinking. Do you watch any football? <laughs> just just go, go on YouTube and just watch maybe just 10 of our matches and just see what he does and make your own opinion. And it, it, it's, I, I think that, you know, like I said to you, we're submerged in, in, in championship football and we make the presumption that everybody knows. But I've got no shadow of a doubt that Ollie Watkins, as long as um, he's playing with the right players who are unable to make him, you know, give him the ball, make him play his game, you know, I mean, he probably couldn't fit into any team in the Premier League. But as long as he's playing the right players with the right manager and they also give him the right type of development, I've no doubt that Ollie Watkins will be able to do a job. But obviously, everyone else in the team has got to do a job as well. It can't be all about him. And that's the thing, you know, as long as the pressure isn't on him as well, he needs to be working with a side that is working, that, that all, the, all the cogs are wearing in that side. And that's very important. I think uh, what Villa fans do want to know is rather than Billy is uh, have you do you know anything about uh, Saeed Ben Rami? Because I felt like he'd be a lock like Ollie Watkins to move day one. I feel like people were kind of looking at you as a shame. It would happen to us, didn't it? When we lost to Fulham, people looking at Jack Grealish moving on um, when when we collapsed in the final. Um, so I, I, you know, I thought Ben Rami would be moving day one. Do you know anything that's happening there with him? Because uh, he seems like a lot to move as well. Yeah, I mean, the, this is the thing, right? I mean. We have, a, we have a little kind of, again, you know, we, we have a little bit of frustration with the transfer window. I mean, with us, I think with Oli, Oli's got, he's got a great agent who, you know, who works together with clubs. You know, some agents work against them, but he's got a great agent who works together with clubs. And uh, they, they, there would have been a plan A, a plan B and a plan C. So, if you know, once the season's finished, we knew that we we're going to get in Ivan Tony. It would be better for us and for Oli and everyone like that if he's in place. So those, and we know Dean Smith. So, you know, all, it was it was probably a really good little motion of, of conversations that were happening there. I'm not saying that other players don't necessarily have that as such, but I think that also the transfer window is probably too long as far as I'm concerned. You know, what you've got is that you've got this window where maybe you get a bit of activity at the, at the beginning, 
you've got nothing in the middle for ages and people get disrupted and you've got games playing and lots of rumours. It, it fuels rumours for Sky and TV and newspapers and that. But it's a bit of a pain, to be honest with you. And then the last week, you get a bit of activity probably in the last two days. And, you know, we're sort of saying, why can't you just make the transfer window a week or three days? It'll be, it'll make it, it'll be so oh containment. Can you imagine the strength? Everybody, you know, we did that. So what's happened with Ben Rama now? Listen, Ben Rama, we've developed him up. He's a great player. He's got a value as far as we've concerned. And um, yes, of course, he's going to go, but he's going to go for a fee that we want to sell him for. So at the end of the day, is if somebody comes in and says, we're going to give you 12 million from Ben Rama, we're going to go, ah, well, I'm sorry, he's not going to go. And years ago with Brentford, we would have sold him. You know, we sold DJ Campbell for £500,000 after he scored a goal, two goals against Sunderland in the FA Cup because we were absolutely desperate. And he sold him to a you know, Premier League team at the time because we were desperate. And people think that just because we're Brentford and we don't get big crowds, you know, we're going to do the same. But things have completely changed with Brentford, as you know. You know, we've made sort of nearly £100 million in players over the last three years, you know. And it's not all about making money, but it's being able to be strong enough that you can hold off teams so that they're not actually holding you to ransom. And we're saying, listen, we're happy to sell Ben Rama, but our price is you now £20 million or £22 million, whatever it may be. And that's kind of where it's at. So if teams are coming in and trying to chisel us out, We've got till October, <laughs> the middle of October, unfortunately, uh, to, to kind of play that game out, you know. So, and that, like I said to you, I'd much rather if that window is three, three days. So teams will come in and just say, all right, 12 million. We say, no, it's not. And then the next day they go, oh, here you go, here's 20 million, then you're done. <laughs> but, um, you know, but maybe somebody could sort that out again because, uh, you know, they, they, they don't seem to be working in the favour <laughs> of the teams at the moment. Um, we'll go back to Watkins briefly. I think the thing that Villa fans would, would be concerned about is that we've seen strikers play for us in, in recent years, one up front on their own, and they don't get the service. It doesn't matter how many how many goals they've scored elsewhere. Scott Hogan is a perfect example. Score goals at Brentford, comes into Villa, doesn't fit the system, doesn't score goals, and then you're left with a player that's on big money and they, they barely play. With Watkins, it's, it almost feels a little bit like not that you build a side around it, but you have to play to his strengths to get the best out of it. I know that's an obvious thing to say. A hundred percent. I mean, again, you know, I mean, I, we do a pod, podcast that we're sorted, be um, Pride of West dot London as well. I'm, I think we're going to be recording tonight as well, so you should definitely check it out. But, you know, um, you know, besotted dot com. And we, you know, we, we've had a lot of interaction with, you know, with your Villa guys, you know, I talked to, you know, your Villa View guys, you know, at the heart of the whole, you know, we talked, I've just talked to a lot over the years. And uh, when, you know, when you, you, you get a signing between the teams, you know, you always get a bit of interaction, especially between the fan blog sites. So we spoke to yeah. you guys that said, you know, what, yeah, Scott Hogan. And they said, oh, yeah, we're signing Scott Hogan for 12 million. We, you know, to be fair, okay, we've never heard of him. What's he like? <laughs> we're like, he's a, he's, a, he's a great striker, but we're not quite sure he's right for you. And we, we weren't trying to be disrespectful, but we were thinking, why is he going to Fuller Villa? Because Villa aren't playing the right type of football for him. I mean, they're going to give us 12 million pounds. So we'll, we'll take that all day long. And uh, but, so we sold him to you and it wasn't a right fit. So, yes, you kind of know when the situation is right and when it isn't right. With Ollie Watkins, I would like to think if you're paying 28 million or 33 million pounds for a player, that you would have kind of worked out who's going to fit into your system. So I would say that, yes, Ollie Watkins is a great striker. He scored goals, but obviously needs the ball to get goals. The only way he's going to get the ball is either if it's played to him or if he comes deep to get the ball. So you're going to have to have a system where Ollie Watkins is going to have to... Um, well, he's going to have to basically uh, be served in the right way. He's going to have to be the right type of system. Now, Dean Smith, I mean, we're playing slightly, obviously, Ollie Watkins is playing slightly different position than when Dean Smith was there. But, you know, again, you know, Dean has to just have a look at Ollie Watkins, have a look at, you know, the last three two seasons of Brentford videos to see kind of how we played with Ollie, what we did with Ollie, you know, how he kind of worked with us. And I'm not saying that he's got to take lessons of us, but that's part of the, the whole coaching thing as well. How did Ollie work with Brentford? What were they doing? How are they, you know, what are the wingers doing? What were they doing in midfield? You know, was he coming deep? Was he, you know, all this kind of stuff. So I'd be very surprised if Villa don't um, start working your game around Ollie Watkins because he is, he is key. There's a, quite an interesting comment from Will Fowler, actually. He says it's just coming late, but um, who do you feel was better for Brentford, Watkins or Malpai? Obviously, we linked with Malpai last season, went to Brighton for 20 odd million. A lot of Villa fans looked at that in hindsight and thought, oh, if we'd have just spent the money and got the guy we wanted, that's what we've done this year, isn't it? We, we've decided that Watkins is the target. We've stumped up the cash. So hopefully, that, that says a lot that this is who we wanted. And then, we'll, we'll, like I said before, we'll kind of make our team around him effectively with, with Jack Grealish as well. 
Yeah, I really, I mean, I think you've made a, a really a, a quite a, quite a valid point there. I mean, last season with Neil Malpay, I mean, I thought Neil Malpay would would go to Villa again. You know, I was, you know, like I said to you, I was at the the playoff semi final and the final last season. I was filming some stuff and fan stuff for Sky, which you've probably seen actually. There's all the sort of fan video stuff, which was between Villa and West Brom. I was sort of filming that. I was on the terraces, sort of jumping between the West Brom end and the and the Aston Villa end. And I, I had a little <laughs> chat to Dean Smith. And again, it wasn't a sort of kind of like you know yeah, secret chat and stuff. And he just you know said to me, "Hello, Billy, how you doing? You know, how's it going? You know, you've got you know Neil Malpay, you've got you know Ben Rama, you know, you've got these players." And you know, he was basically in effect, he was saying, you know, he expected them to go. He wouldn't say they're going to go, but he knows Brentford's system is that every two years we let a player go. And Malpay has scored eighteen goals, and uh, he was hot property. So I think he expected it to go, and I, I not, you know, I, I actually said to him, I said to him, oh, I bet you'd like Neil down here, wouldn't you, Dean? He didn't say anything. He just sort of smiled at me, you know. But you know, gave you a wink, <laughs> you know. But no, but the thing is that you know, you, I know, and you know, he, he, of course, he would want it to be down there. Now, at the end of the day, yeah. um, listen, he went in, you know, Villa went in for him. They didn't put in enough money for for Malpay. Malpay went to Brighton, which is a surprise because. Um, um, Brentford and, and Brighton don't normally do business together for for various reasons, which I won't go into. So he actually, the, you know, the fact that he actually went there was a little bit of a kind of question mark. Now I believe that um, you know, and you went out and got the Brazilian, um, who, to be fair, was more money, but I don't think it was good as good a player. Now I believe because Villa didn't go in that time, it's probably given Dean Smith real ammunition to turn around and said, didn't get Malpay, should have got Malpay. You know, I told you, Brentford know what they're doing. They've got um, Watkins now. He would have been 16 million now. He's 28 million now, but he's going to be 40 million in two years' time. We should just buy him. And he gave him the ammunition to go in there and 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 and, and get the money that he, what they wanted or the money that Brentford wanted. That's what I believe would have happened, definitely. Who's the better player? Different players. I really love Neil Malpay. He's brilliant, and especially when he sort of scores a goal and then stands in front of the home end like he did to the sleep fans, both home and away. And I thought, oh, God, we shouldn't be doing that. But, <laughs> but um, he, he doesn't mind. He's got so much bottle. Um, I, I, I love them both. I, it's hard for me to say. Ollie You're on Watkins, a Villa podcast now. You have to say Watkins. <laughs> well, no, Watkins, is, Watkins is probably an all round a better player and got more potential. But I really do like them both. Okay, nice. Anything to add, James? Any more questions? No, I just thought it was a nice diplomatic answer to finish on <laughs> without upsetting anyone, uh, but giving us still that little bit of hype we needed on a, what is a, a big day for us, I guess, yeah. We've been waiting uh, for this a long time, mate, so uh, thank no, you for your insight. Now, listen, thanks for inviting me. Like I said to you, I wish Ollie Watkins all the best. I really hope that he does the business. I really want to. I've got tickets for the Euros next year, so I really want to walk inside that stadium and they say, and the number nine is Ollie Watkins. And I'll be like, yes, I told you it's going to happen because, you know, it sounds like a bit of a pipe dream. But listen, you know, you've had a couple of players that popped up in the England team when you were gone from the Championship to the Premier League. So as far as I'm concerned, if you're good enough, anything can happen. And this player really, really is good enough. He's a nice enough bloke. And he actually really, really deserves it. Again, you know, again, one of the people who were very senior said that, you know, uh, a couple of years ago when we signed him, they said that he was probably one of the best players that we've ever signed at Brentford uh, in terms of potential and, and what he's doing, you know. So, and, and, and you know, and how old was he? He wasn't, you know, he was what, 22 then as well. So I just think that, you know, I'm, I'm bigging him up here. I'm, I'm really sad that he's, I, honestly, I'm really sad that he's going. I really am sad because I've loved him to continue the journey with us. We've got our new stadium. Um, which we're going to hopefully be in that summer stage in the next 12 months. Um, you know, and I'd love to have seen him play in, the, in, in that new stadium with us, you know, and hopefully, you know, get us the Premier League or play in the Premier League. But it hasn't happened. So, listen, good luck to him. You know, scoreless goals. We've got our new phase coming on, the new Brentford, Ivan Tony, and the new Posse. And it's going to be starting on Saturday. And fingers crossed, it could be Birmingham. Like we didn't do last season when we played the oh, first game of the season. That'd be lovely. <laughs> That would be lovely. Um, there's, one, there's one final story I wanted to end on, just as a, a little light-hearted comment. Um, I've seen a video of Ollie Watkins, and I've, I've not watched any of his, his interviews yet. He comes across as a nice guy, you can tell. He speaks well. He, he seems very considered for, for a young man, uh, 24 years old. Uh, talk to me about Dean Smith, Ollie Watkins, and a fish tank. What's the story, oh, yeah. what's the story there? A fish tank. So, um, allegedly... <laughs> I always got to say allegedly. No, um, apparently um, when Ollie moved into his new apartment, or I should say flat actually, because we live in England, we're not an American, um, 
Dean Smith bought Ollie Watkins a fish tank as a present, as a sort of a moving in present. So, you know, Ollie's really happy and apparently he's got the fish tank in his house. Then I heard down the line, again, this needs to be verified if this is true or not. Um, apparently the fish died because I think Ollie overfed the fish. So, uh, you know, so Ollie got the fish tank and he got the fish, but the fish died because he overfed the fish. So it'll be interesting to see whether or not as a, a new signing on present, <laughs> Dean Smith is going to buy him another fish tank and also give him some instructions on how to actually feed the fish. Oh, I wish I could make some kind of clever link about feeding the fish <laughs> and feeding him and scoring goals or something, but I'm not quick enough to think of these things. Uh, but right. thank you very much, Billy, for joining us this afternoon. Really appreciate having the, the inside track on Ollie Watkins and uh, hopefully we utilise him better than we have uh, Scott Hogan and we get to see him scoring goals for Villa and, and England one day. That'd be lovely. OK, thanks for having me, guys. Nice one. Thanks, Billy. See you later, mate. Yes. See you, man. The brutal cut off on the podcast. Someone just <laughs> in the beam when they've gone, they've gone now. Yeah, um, it's a lovely insight, man. Uh, we, yeah, great, I, great. Stuff I know up. so much more about Ollie Watkins, Neil Magpie, even Dean Smith than I knew. Uh, previously. Red fish yeah. transfer strategy as well. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I, I ever thought I needed to. The thing is, with yeah. stuff like this, you and me could sit here and, and look at research and read Wikipedia and watch uh, videos on YouTube and kind of try and guess what, what Ollie Watkins is like from a few YouTube clips. But it's nice, isn't it, to get someone who actually watches them week in, week out for 90 minutes. To come on and sit here and talk for 15 20 minutes or so so thanks to billy for joining us as i said and like we did last week with matty cash you know it's nice to have that inside track and like you said we we know more about him now than we did before um are you excited very um i feel like um a lot has been made of the fee uh do i think it's overpriced uh yeah do i care no because we wanted Ollie. <laughs> look you, you, i hate the way we speak about footballers i think i don't i'm not going to go back to all or nothing we're not going to mention it this podcast uh, i feel like you, you talk about footballers as assets right and not human beings um ollie watkins is an asset villa needed and wanted and identified he had a price uh i can tell you that brentford wanted a lot more than we paid for him um so we, we've had to bring that down knock it down probably we didn't get him for like the 18 20 million we wanted to pay we had to go up to 28, uh, eventually stretching to uh, 33. But look, it's a negotiation between two parties that have their own interests. So it's always going to be finding that middle ground. Like I could say, Dan, do you want my headphones right for 40 quid? And you offer me 20. Like <laughs> you, have to, you have to find that middle ground. <laughs> right. 10, mate. Yeah, 28 quid, five uh, if they work in a, a few years' time. Now, that's how things, it's like you have to find that middle ground. They don't know. Brentford and Villa have a, a relationship, and it's not just through Dean Smith, it's through the dealings they've done over the years. So they know each other fairly well. Ollie Watkins was interested in joining Villa, so it's easy to get got done. But look, this is a simple deal. That took a long time. Uh, this was from day one since uh, Brentford yeah. um, lost that player final. This has been on the go, hasn't it, since then, and it hasn't been done. Uh, you know, in seconds, it's been done in weeks, if, if not months. It's been in, in the pipeline for ages. That's how these things work. They cost a lot of money. I don't care how much it is. It's not coming out of my pocket. It's a it's a budget. Villa is sensible. They made a budget and he was in it. So there we go. Yeah, just talk in the comments about comparisons with Tyro Mings. Nah. When we start, no, but I'm, I'm talking from other fans. When we start, oh, yeah, yeah. people saying, oh, he's overpriced. But he's an England international now, isn't he? I would, yeah. I would assume if, if someone came in for Tyro Mings tomorrow we would make a profit on it. So yeah. the theory is that Ollie Watkins comes in for 28. If, you know, there's people saying, oh, he'll never play for England. It's opinions, isn't it? It doesn't matter if Billy thought that he's good enough to go and play for England. That, that will be, you know, no one's got a crystal ball. No one knows either way. Um, but if he does go on to do that and scores goals, goals for Villa, Chelsea, Arsenal, Man United come in, they're going to have to pay more than 28 anyway. So transfer fees are, Kind of irrelevant until after the fact. Was was Scott Hogan overpriced? Yes, because he it was a failure. Was Ross McCormack overpriced? Yes, yes, for the same reason. You know, it works both ways, doesn't it? You, you get players for cheap sometimes as well. So transfer fees don't really bother me. We, we talked about this yesterday. Um, somebody saying Wolves pay thirty five million for an unknown kid in in silver, and no one bats an eye at that. Yeah, it's swings around about us, isn't it? I don't really care about what other teams are doing. Villa need a goal scorer. This is who they wanted. We've got our man, and you have to pay whatever the cost is. Yeah, you. Like, it's not just the guy they want, it's the, the top target. It's the yeah. guy that fit all the metrics they wanted. Villa is smart. And it's not the first time in, like, however long you can actually say that Villa are doing actual deals and they create that, you know, they've got a plan and Ollie Watkins fits that plan. I remember, um, if I go on to it real quickly, Smarter Scout, this um, uh, analytics website that has kind of detailed um, templates and stuff, they, they had a lot of good things to say about Ollie Watkins and I hammered them. When they um, criticised Samata, right, I hammered them. 
and they were right. They turned out to be right. So I'm, <laughs> trusting them. I'm trusting them in this. And they start, the templates they've got with uh, Watkins, he's not a classic target man. He's going to be shooting from close range. Villa need to give him the service. That's absolutely key. They need to give him the service. Um, but what, what Watkins possibly has, um, if that service isn't being provided, is the mentality to adapt and change, which is massively key. Villa have identified that template. He fits it. He fits it perfectly. And play styles he's compared with is uh, not just Callum Wilson, who was obviously linked to Villa, Casper uh, Dolberg. I'm not going to mention the biggest name in here because you just you you will get. I've told you who it was. Um, you can go find out for yourself. <laughs> But uh, with Sam Ben Yedda, Casper Dahlberg, it fits. It fits it for you me. Can't, you can't uh, tease the audience like that, mate. Uh, it's it's Falcao. It's a talky Falcao. <laughs> like, that's not me saying it. That's them. <laughs> the talky <laughs> Falcao. <laughs> oh, I hope he has that on the back of his shirt. But <laughs> the I think Falcao. I think a massive downside, Dan, is Villa could have had him years ago. Oh, that is annoying, isn't it? Two you, there's always things like that, though, isn't there? You always hear yeah. stories like that. And was that ever really? Yeah, it, yeah, because like Villa have done. Look, what we have to the negative there it turns into a positive. Villa have got Louis Barry in, they've kept um Carney Chukwemeka on a contract, they signed the pro deal. Um, Sils Finkles, a few other youngsters coming into the club. Um, Shaq Poke from uh Norwich probably coming. I think he has signed as no one's really he hasn't been announced because he's under 23 player. Um, these deals have been made now, so I think where we missed out on Ollie Watkins, it's a mistake being learned. So we've got him. We got our man in the end. It costs a lot more, and we've learned that mistake. So it's a win-win. I've not seen any of the quotes from Dean Smith or uh, Ollie Watkins yet. I think you've you've got them in front of you, but I can guess. Yeah, it's happy pointless. to join a big club, <laughs> big stadium. Happy to get my man. He's been out, yeah. big target, etc. So the usual stuff from from Smith and Watkins. Yeah, it's just uh, the mental. He's got the mentality to succeed and the ability to exist- succeed at the highest level, which is, I think, it's evident. Like, there's a difference with Scott Hogan. Yes, Scott Hogan scored twenty goals, but was he playing in a system that suited him very well? Watkins had that adversity of having to adapt to a new position, so I feel like that already is like a step up. You know, like he had to find and adapt to a position. Not he wasn't that system wasn't built around him. He had to move yeah. into it. So for me, it works. Um, or going back to his time in Exeter, not moving to Brentford at the, when he had the chance to, uh, I think, have a loan spell at Western Supermare. Like, that smacks me. It's like he isn't just taking any opportunity to get a bigger deal or a bigger contract. He's taking it at the, the perfect time. Like, he could have moved last year for a much cheaper fee to a club who may not have used him. So like hanging on, scoring 26 odd goals, moving to Villa for a record fee. It fits perfectly for me. Like again, we ain't gonna say anything until we see the season starts and he's playing regular football. Anything could happen. We paid well, how how ever much money for Wesley last season and he was injured. Yeah. We have to see. We you know we can't make these snap judgments, but the outset, the template he fits in terms of analytics, how he fits in Villa suits me. There's a couple of counterpoints to the transfer fee thing that I want to talk about in the comments. Now I'm going to leave it because I'm bored of talking about it. Uh, Mick Wald- Waldridge uh, says, if we'd have missed out on Ollie and he'd gone to Spurs, fans would have been moaning saying, why didn't Villa spend the money? Which is a great point. That is perfectly summarising you know, football fans' opinions that we paid it, people are saying we'd overpaid. If we'd not have done it, people are going, oh, Villa is so cheap. I can't believe we let him go 25 million, blah, blah, blah. Also, the other side of it, people are saying it's too much money. If we'd have signed a striker from Sweden for six million, and he'd have been the number one. People would be going, where's Villa's ambition? They're spending yeah. too little money. Like It doesn't matter, does it? We need to judge these players and what they do. If he scores 30 goals, bargain. If he scores two, yeah, we've had our pants pulled down. Yeah, it's, a, it's a, like a horrible little bit of tribalism, isn't it? It's like you get Villa fans hammering leads for paying for a for like nearly 30 million for a gig who barely scored, barely played for Valencia or whatever. Doesn't matter that you, you identify Bielsa identifies that guy as a main guy. They pay the money, they get him in. Yeah. We identify this guy as a main guy. We pay the money and get it. it I think we're fed up of talking about that now. It's just <laughs> yeah, can you it, tell? Look, <laughs> we can't change that opinion. That's out there. We can't change how anyone feels about fees. But all we can say is football clubs have to pay the money to get who they want. Easy. Yeah, so it's two two talking points I want to end on. They are what happens next in terms of who we sign next, and yeah. also how Watkins fits into the system. So we'll tackle that first. We assume Watkins comes in as the main number nine, or is he going to play out wide and we've got another striker to come in at some point? Yeah, um, I think it's been very clearly stated that Villa won uh, a midfielder and another striker and a winger. So you've got three positions there everyone wants filled at the very least. You've got another striker. So it's another marquee by, by its striker eventually coming in, whether it's Josh King, Ryan Booster, whomever 
they choose it. I think that'll be that's going to be one on the back burner now. Right now, you've got Watkins and possibly a winger. I think Villa will be smart to wait for any deals that might come up that are a bit cheaper than you know launching all their cash at uh, other people. Goalkeeper, I think, might be the next one. So Emiliano Martinez, some training yeah. today at Arsenal. Villa lodged a second bid of about 15 odd million, which is a bit close. It's again, it's like Arsenal want 20, Villa wanting to pay 10. Find that middle ground. I think he'll come in, he'll be the starter, he'll get everything he wants for the first few weeks, and then he's got to prove himself. But look, he wants to be a starting goalkeeper. Villa can offer him that for the yeah. time being. Best chance to prove himself as well. So the transfers, I think time to be a bit patient on that now. I think Villa, I know we've been patient already. <laughs> I was going to say, feel, yeah. Like you've got another month now to deadline day. Uh, Villa have got kind of the main guy they wanted in the main position they wanted so it's up to them now they've got the money they've still got money to spend don't get me wrong but they've brought in Matty Cash they've brought in Watkins players will come back it'll be till deadline day and Villa can then react to the situation that emerge and get the best deals possible and yeah. probably not get the mickey taken out of them for spending 30 million on whomever they'll avoid that humiliation uh, but yeah time to wait and see I think if a, if a good deal becomes available for a big name winger somebody like a Ben Rama he comes in and obviously starts out wide and Watkins yeah. is your main number nine. If you can't get the winger you're after, Watkins can cover both bases and you'll sign another striker who will start up front. So it could be Grealish, King, Watkins, and then Watkins can obviously play centrally as well. Um, yeah, what about backup up front then? What happens with the strikers we've already got? You've got Wesley, Samata, Davis and Watkins now. Um, is there a loan for Davis? Is Davis the one you keep around as the matter leaves? Obviously, Wesley's got to come back, so we're not, not going to see him for a while anyway. Um, what would you be doing with that, that strike force, especially if you're going to add another one to the list as well? Yeah, I think it's... Um, I I'm, I'm, haven't got um, some as a length of contract in mind, to be fair, um, but I think Davis is the one that you ship out on loan because he does have very clear potential there and he performed at, he wasn't scoring at Premier League level but he was performing at Premier League level so I think Championship loan spell nailed on I would do that um, Samata and Wesley I feel as with Samata keep around like yes last year we didn't have a Samata to bring off the bench like we didn't have anyone of a, a, yeah. I mean people don't rate him but I think you didn't have that certain level of experience or quality being able to come off the bench at all so in the meantime until we get another striker deal he's got to stick around Wesley come back when Wesley comes back it's a different conversation we don't know what state he'll be in when he comes back it's a serious injury so again wait and see but in the meantime they're sticking around um, Villa probably concentrating on those outgoings in the next few weeks so we'll see then uh, what the plan is but I think there's a, obviously a few names that are popping up that are going to be shipped out maybe your, your Lansbury um, your hot Hogan, Hogan. Um, obviously Gilbert has got mentioned. We said at the start of the podcast, Gilbert got mentioned. We don't. No, that's not a clear say. I'm staying. It's saying this is rubbish. I want like, to stay. Yeah. yeah, this is rubbish. But you know, I want him to stay. I think he's brilliant. I think he's made it very clear where his priorities lie. But it just it just depends on what what falls up in the next month, man. Yeah, I've been trying to Google um, Isamata's contract length while you were talking there, and the first thing that came up was the podcast that you and I did about him when he signed. It's like, well, there's no information in that because it was ours. Um, yeah, talking about outgoings, we've talked a, a lot about on this show when we, you know, obviously we work on, on other clubs. Um, thing of the transfer windows, it, it, it always depends on what the buying club wants to do, doesn't it? Stoke yeah. City want to sell a lot of players, Leicester need to move a few players on. I'll talk about Midlands clubs that we, yeah. we we work with. Villa want players to move on, but if no one wants to come and give Henry Lansbury 40 grand a week or whatever, no yeah, one's going to come in for him and he's going to have to run down his contract with Villa. And that, that's what poor recruitment has led to, ultimately, for Villa over the years. We talked a lot, didn't we, uh, when we signed Cash about it, it seemed like a wise deal to give him that length of contract. We said yesterday um, about Callum Wilson going to Newcastle on a big long contract, Ryan Fraser, big wages, big contract. Then Watkins signs for us today as a 24-year-old about to hit his prime on a five-year deal for less money than Callum Wilson. And you think, yeah, that makes sense. That is smart. Yes, it might be a big transfer fee, but his wages are more reasonable and that builds Villa a better structure. Yeah, it's it, again, it's, it's just waiting and seeing. I think Villa's priority, again, like we said, will probably move on to shipping a few players out and adjusting the squad and keeping that like dynamic going within the team. I feel like yeah. they probably see in Samata and Wesley come back, people with the personalities to kind of fight and maybe push Watkins ideally. Uh, but again, Villa won that strike deal in, so that's going to change that dynamic completely. Uh, Josh King, Rian Buster, whoever comes in, whether it's someone on deadline day, whether it's someone in the next week, will change how the, the squad lines up, will change how it looks on the bench will change the dynamic we'll see yeah i think i think that does us for today we've covered 40 minutes again somehow somewhere 
I don't know why we just keep talking about we did this we did this same podcast literally yesterday just to well maybe Watkins or sign and then today it's confirmed and we've still managed to talk for so long. Uh, so I think we probably you probably won't see of us till next week now at this point unless Villa signs someone else this week, which I could do with a break to be honest. I keep saying that we need to get deals done, but lots of busy things going on this morning. So yeah, uh, great to talk about a signing, a club transfer as well. Well, well, no, you messaged me about doing this podcast before we started. I was thinking, oh, how much can we say about Watkins when we, we talked about him yesterday? And then you realise for 28 yeah. million, this breaks our transfer record. Like, this is a big deal. Yeah. Uh, again, I feel like Villa had to make that big deal. I think every season from now on, there's probably going to be that record breaking deal. Right, uh, next season they're going to go. Yeah. They have to go bigger than probably the next season. It'll probably be three or four years before we settle down. I was going to say, do you think? Do you think we'll break it again this summer? Well, Ooh, not summer now, but the, you know what I mean. Do, the, are we going to go bigger than twenty-eight million? I think it's because like, Tyron Mings technically costs more than Wesley, right? With the add-ons, so uh, yeah, yeah so. It's, no one counts the add-ons. Every fee's an instalment. Like you don't pay. 28 million now. Here you go, Brentford. Here's a big sack of cash. <laughs> all, it's all installments, and you have to negotiate with a bank whether they're going to like buy that in for a fee like, to get that full full amount of money. Yeah. So these, the way these record things are explained, it's not correct because Villa have made a record transfer over the next five years. They have. Not now. Yeah. But, you know, it, it just... I think there is a scope, isn't there, to break the record. Villa, if it was rumoured, it's 100 million. There's still money to spend. There's still yeah. big money to spend. How much is that we spent now? Is it forty-ish, forty-five, something like so, that? So, yeah, sixteen. Yeah, yeah, you, you, you spot on there because our the, the exact fees we don't really. I know it's in the budget, but we don't really know the exact amount of money yeah. that, that Villa have spent. The budget should be there for another splash. It could be a record transfer. I don't think so because Villa have a, a midfielder they want, a striker they want, a goalkeeper they want. Don't see it happening unless a perfect opportunity comes available to bring yeah. someone. Yeah, it depends what comes up, doesn't it? I think if you look yeah. at Martinez, initially you're thinking 10 million. If that's pushing closer to 20, Watkins you probably thought would be 20 and that's pushed closer to 30. Um, and everyone costs a little bit more than you expect, don't they? Um, I'd be surprised if Villa spent more than 28 million on a single signing this window again. Um, ben Rama, potentially. What, uh, Watford? Um, Brentford could potentially ask for for more than they did yeah. um, for Watkins, but I don't know. I don't see. I don't see Villa spending another thirty plus million on a single player. I can see him spending another forty or fifty million total, um, but that'll be on three or four players. I thought. Um, but yeah, we'll just have to wait and see. It's exciting, isn't it? It's nice to have some some official signs through the door, something that you know genuine to talk about. You know, the striker that we wanted is in before the first game of the season as well, which is yeah. massive. Uh, yeah. I think that game's been pushed back to the Monday as well now, isn't it? The Sheffield United game for TV. Yeah, it's on a so. Sky Pick, I think, so it's actually free to air if you have that channel. So, win-win. I, nice. wanted, to see, I wanted to see the game, now I get to see it. <laughs> yeah, nice. Um, so, yeah, we'll call it a day there. Thanks, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. There's been a lot of viewers, a lot of comments and questions, like always. Uh, hopefully, we've been able to clear up a few things uh, regarding transfers and obviously Watkins with uh, Billy the Bee from earlier. Oh, I forgot to tell my Billy the Bee story when he was on air. <laughs> we'll finish it out, yeah. Well, yeah, we'll save, the, save his embarrassments. I texted James earlier and said, <laughs> oh, I'm going to get Billy, Billy the Bee on the podcast. And he said, who's he? The mascot. And I, I wasn't like, taking the mic. Like, I, I genuinely thought, like, Harry the Hornet, and it. I thought, like... <laughs> Why are you going to get the mascot on to speak about Ollie Watkins? That's done Billy down because he's a great guy. Like that's, a great, that's, <laughs> that's on you. That's it's on you. Can you imagine if I was just like, "Thanks for joining us, Billy," and then I had him into the chat and he's just sat there in a B costume. <laughs> oh, oh mate, this podcast would never be taken seriously again. I wish and it you doesn't take seriously on. anyone. Yeah, I wish we got to play Watford because you've got to get Harry the Hornet on so he can tell us about you know, the party with Roy <laughs> Oh, dear. Maybe we'll all get you a lion costume one day and you can be a be, you can be Hercules or something on air. That'll be quite fun. Okay. Okay, yeah. All right. Well, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Another rambly ending, as always. But, uh, yeah, it's been a good one. I'm going to go and grab some lunch and watch and yeah. read all the Ollie Watkins stuff that we've missed. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you for listening to Claret and Blue, an Aston Villa podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, then please let us know. We love hearing your feedback. We'll be back soon with another episode. Until then, up the villa.